All right, should we get started, Joseph? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, well, you were already chomping at the bit to say something about the chapter, so why don't you get us started? Go ahead. Um, just the scene when you when uh, the description of Juliet waking up, you know, he's gone through this ordeal, and just the I'm trying to pull it up in my notes, but just the way he describes how he's awakening mm -hmm. before he discovers that the paunch is fine and he can he succeeded, but um there's so many details and i'll try and find it but i just thought that was absolutely breathtaking well so this is embar an embarrassing confession but i'm going to make it anyway i can't remember whether i read this book long long ago started this book long long ago or just was told about it long ago but the way it stood in my mind was man against the elements and mm -hmm. I thought that that was the entirety of the novel was man against the elements. And I could see reading it and being left with that impression because that's the part that captures the imagination most. Everything else is kind of a framework around the battle with the sea. Um, but uh, I, I was surprised reading it this time how many chapters there are before he even sets out to sea. So that was that was an interesting discovery um but fundamentally is it a story of man against the elements i don't know that's a good that's a good topic for conversation it's certainly what what um cap i mean i think if you were to do a survey of people who have read toilers of the sea and to ask them what they remember most probably most would mention this um I was reading some secondary sources on it and there was a line from, it was uh, from Kirkus Reviews. And it says, those of us who first read this novel in the classic comics version half a century ago will be grateful to discover, this is something I want to discuss, that Hugo's impossibly grandiose and overblown yarn remains as perversely irresistible as ever. So that was the account of this impossibly grandiose, overblown, and perversely irresistible. But as soon as I read that, I thought, oh, I need to get the classic comics version. So that's uh, that's what it looks like. I haven't read it yet. Um, so let's see. Well, <laughs> general impressions of this section anything anyone want to say about it I mean it's just absolutely thrilling breathtakingly thrilling oh look at that <laughs> it's slightly different cover but still the uh octopus uh, Shoshana has the same um Shoshana were you familiar did you encounter that at some point in your life or did you go seeking it after reading about it well, um, I think Bill Bucko was the one who told me I ought to get it because he mm. had a collection of all all of those. And, you know, the, the classics illustrated were much better written than you might imagine. Mm. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, some of them were written by, I mean, they don't have bylines on them, but they were written by writers who later were known for their own works. And I, I thought this, this, uh. was, this was pretty good. And, of course, one of the things you see from it is that the, the pieuvre, the devil fish, is a lot bigger than Gilead. Mm. I mean, there's basically, and and that's not the way I picture Gilead, but still, I, I I thought it was thought it was well done. And Kirkus Review is doing what people often do with Victor Hugo is that they acknowledge his power while trying to make fun of him. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so perversely irresistible. He's not denying that everybody will be taken in by yes. this, but. But it's, it's trying to be sort of a cynical above it all snob about it. Yeah. I think we've seen that movie before, you know, mm -hmm. with other, other writers who are exciting and adventurous and people are, are embarrassed that, that they were so absorbed because they think they need to be cool. Well, I, I'd like to read a quote to counter the Kirkus review, uh, okay. which is, let's see if I can find it quickly. Um. Oh boy. Uh, I can't know. It might take me a minute to find it, but the idea was that, um, oh, I think I know where to find it. 
the this was Swinburne said this oh yeah of the sea it was his favorite of Hugo's novels and he say he says I may perhaps be permitted to say without fear of deserved rebuke that none is to me personally a treasure of greater price than Les Travailleurs de, Mer, de la Mer. The splendid energy of the book makes the superhuman energy of the hero seem not only possible but natural and his triumph over all physical impossibilities not only natural but inevitable. So we've got one person saying it's impossibly grandiose and overblown, and the other saying Hugo has written it such that we find it entirely believable and that it seems not only possible, but inevitable once we've met his character. So what, what, side, <laughs> what side do you take in this debate? Well, Swinburne, of course, he's an overblown poet himself. <laughs> No, seriously, and yeah. he's, he's written a fair amount about Hugo. He says you need to read him not by our own little candles, but by the light of a turn, something like that. You know, he's mm -hmm. he, he really appreciates Hugo. I think he went to visit him. Mm -hmm. I, I think that happened. So I'm, I'm not surprised that Swinburne is enthusiastic. And mm -hmm. I've got something. Of, anyway, it's it's not upstairs, but I, I've I've got something that uh, maybe even book length. That he's written about yeah. ago maybe a couple of essays so he, he's a he's a real fan a real fan yeah but may i guess we'd have to think about what it means to call him impossibly grandiose mm -hmm. what it means for a writer to be impossibly grandiose does it mean do we have to believe that a single man could very literally take on all of these challenges by himself do we have to believe that that is very literally possible to um, think that this is not grandiose and overblown. And that seems like a false premise and a false dichotomy to me that um, it can be not, we might be skeptical that this could be literally true, um, but we couldn't, we might be skeptical it could be literally true, but still see it as I don't know, plausible, plausible in some sense. I'm not sure exactly how to put it, but it is, it's romantic art. So it's not, it's meant to be an abstraction from reality that's capturing something of the essence of it. And so in its essence, this could be true, even if the literal details are, are not true. Yeah. Now, Guinevere is really going to th throw uh, something in here. She says she found it totally unbelievable and really boring. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I have to say that, especially in this last reading, there was a lot that I just skipped all that exposition about the wind and the waves. And like, I'm just done with it. I'm tired of it. I don't care about Juliet. I don't have any emotion for him. I don't feel for him. I don't know. I don't know what everyone else is getting out of this book because I just don't like it. <laughs> so interesting. Um, I mean, there were, I can relate to there being elements of the details that I found I, I wouldn't skip them, but I wouldn't force my mind to really turn them into a concrete visual reality. There are times that I try to really make myself do that. And there was so much here that I just couldn't sustain that effort. And there was so much where the, just the sheer um, kind of apparatus and, uh, you know, sailing lingo and like all of this stuff that was a, la a layer of barrier for me already so I'd have to look up what all these things are in order to understand what, exactly what he's describing. So there are times I let myself off the hook for that, but there was plenty for me that was just breathtakingly thrilling, despite the presence of those elements. Yeah, but, I just, I don't know, I can't get into it. All of his tasks and toils, it just, it's, to me, it's like, not I, even I don't know. Dangerous. So, yeah, that was totally um, unbelievable because totally, just totally, it was too much. It was almost like he's this God figure already. And then you throw that in on top and it was just like, come on, mm. it's too much. So I'm to go back to the other question you asked where you, you brought up an interesting point, Lisa, about like, is it too grandiose? Mm -hmm. And something occurred to me, would the, that critic say the same thing about, you know, some of the Greek legends, right? That were clearly not real, like 
Hercules going after a, a Hydra or something. Mm -hmm. And I just find an interesting contrast to say we can accept a hero like that in this completely fictionalized sort of scenario, but we have a hard time imagining somebody that's like so perfectly able to deal with the elements, yet that is a more appropriate version of a hero in a lot of ways. I don't know, that just occurred to mm -hmm. me as like a kind of interesting contrast because my impression now of reading this section is like, okay, is a single man going to literally be able to do all of those things? I don't know, but it captures the essence of what hum how human beings should relate to nature around them is mm -hmm. like have the attitude that they could do all of those things mm -hmm. and like heading out to, to figure it out mm -hmm. and solve each problem as it comes out. And that's mm -hmm. like the impression I'm just left with is in this chapter is like, he, he just did everything. He did all the tasks. Are there characters from other works of literature that come to mind? Oh, Luke, I want to hear what you, and maybe you have a thought about this too, but care, other works of literature where someone takes on similar Herculean tasks. Yeah, i am been thinking about that. Um, and a few that come to mind, there's Robinson Crusoe. Um, there's a, a Harrison Ford movie from the 80s called The Mosquito Coast, which might be kind of the opposite worldview of... Uh, what's going on with Gilead. Mm. Um, and there's one that from- Was he just broken by everything that happens? Is that- Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so not to spoil anything. Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really unusual Harrison Ford to see him, mm -hmm. you know, Indiana Jones go mm -hmm. through this too. Mm -hmm. um, and there's- Indiana Jones, there you go. That's... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one from- with upper elementary students, um, Hatchet. Mm. And that's about a, a kid who goes through a plane crash and has to survive on his own in the Canadian wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think, okay, is that, a, what makes Victor Hugo so unbelievable compared to like Hatchet? And, and Hatchet, I think if you, it, it's, almost as, it's almost as unbelievable for me Mm -hmm. as what goes on um and i think it's the style and the stakes that victor hugo and imbues the story with mm -hmm. uh, this is this is not just you know a man trying to get an engine this is man versus nature yeah. uh and with with the with the breadth of history and everything else that has gone on in the history of the world of ex explorers and all that that victor hugo knows is he going to tell you in like 15 paragraph 15 chapters um I, I personally really like survivorless stories. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, one of my favorite pro TV programs is Survivor Man, a guy who goes off for a week without cameras into the wilderness and films himself trying to survive from nothing. So I, 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 I really like seeing Gilead. So this is tailor-made for me. So it's very, I'm very curious to see how, how others react to mm -hmm. this, whether this is really m my bag mm -hmm. uh, it, or I don't know, do you, do you like Guinevere? It's, it, you don't seem to like get involved with the character and care about the character and that's what i'm curious i'm constantly thinking about teaching this mm -hmm. to my high school students so i'm wondering whether or not it's gonna grab everybody's attention or not because i mm -hmm. i would just like dive right on top of it and like yeah i'm so excited but i'm trying to separate out what might be more universally appealing versus what is more appealing to me well, and... my my vote is that you do teach it so that I know the answer to that. <laughs> so okay. just go ahead, just do it as an experiment and then let me know because, okay, one thing that comes to mind immediately, first of all, it's really interesting what you're bringing up about how much this taps into kind of things that inspire you personally. So um, there's also the show Alone, which I watched pretty much on fast forward. It, it became popular among some of my staff. So I decided to give it a try, but I find it tediously long. But it is fascinating to see somebody thrown out into the wilderness. They're allowed to bring like five tools. It's very uh, Gilead Toilers of the Sea. They just like can choose five from among all tools and decide what they think will be the most useful. And then the question is who can survive the longest and what they're able to do is absolutely astonishing. It really is amazing. Um, or, you know, the, one of my colleagues is obsessed with climbing movies, you know, if you want, or climbing 
climbing movies, climbing uh, shows, or just watching climbing competitions. So that's uh, if that's the kind of thing that thrills you and you're uh, steeped in watching people conquer things that seem impossible, <laughs> then you might be more drawn to this as an element. But the other th thing that occurs to me immediately, um, I just had a conversation in my office yesterday about the book Shane that seems maybe relevant here. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of my colleagues was saying that he feels like he ought not to have told him his daughter certain things that he's told her because it, he thinks it's going to undermine her her like joyful, benevolently expectant worldview. And he's like, I just didn't need to to tell her that. That's a separate question. We'll put that aside. But what it made me think of was a moment in Shane um, where a little boy asks his hero, if you'd been practiced, he never could have the enemy never could have hit you, right? And um, Shane pauses for a moment and says, yeah, that's right. Um, basically confirms his expectation that the good guy always wins, the bad guy always loses, and that's what I can expect from life. And he decides that that's what he needed um, in that moment. So we we're just having this conversation about uh, needing a model of the hero always wins as a source of inspiration to you. And that finally, that just another thing that I read, this was from Graham Robb, is he said, the lasting impression is of the scenes which expand in the mind so much like childhood memories that it is a common experience to find on rereading Hugo's novels that far from being too long, they are not nearly as long as they should have been. And then, oh, wait, there was another, um, that's not totally the line. There was another line where he said, um, oh gosh, okay, here it is, uh, that people um, called his book implausible. It was almost universally condemned as implausible as a sign of the author's childishness. And R Rob's answer to that is, in which case one can only advise readers of Hugo's novels not to grow up. <laughs> so I do wonder whether now why it wouldn't do that for some of us and would for others is an interesting question but that's what it feels like to me is it's tapping into that childish desire for the ultimate heroes which is what I think a lot of Greek mythology Greek mythology is universally popular among the students and I think they like those uh, essentialized heroes that are so much larger than life um, yes, that was in reference to Toiler specifically. Luke, thoughts about that, Molly? Yeah, um, right after I read this selection, I went to a concert and it was by a piano player who was doing some classic and some hip hop and a whole bunch of stuff. And the whole concert struck me as so trite compared mm. with Hugo and he got to this one number where he was dedicating it to the victims of COVID who couldn't see their loved ones when they were at the hospital and no one was allowed in to say goodbye mm. and so these, these people were saying goodbye maybe for the last time and then he played a country waltz that he wrote mm. as if that were somehow equivalent and I was I was wanting to be moved and yet was left completely numb by it because I thought you can't put those two together you need something more romantic and higher for such an event to communicate that kind of grief and so it's those deep emotions that you tap into when you can read a Hugo or any romantic art or painting or other kind of artwork that you miss out on if you never go beneath that superficial trite easy kind of piece mm. of music and mm. so i i felt like this man just didn't understand the depth of the grief they must be feeling for him to say that they were somehow equivalent um so, so 
that that was one reason I I really appreciate this particular passage was that it was so emotional and intense and mm. we don't really experience that very mm. often. Mm. So wonder, you know, it, I, oh go ahead. Oh I was just gonna say about it how believable it is. Mm -hmm. Sort of wonder if he like sets you up for um to make it more believable by the fact that you're in this remote corner of the world that no one really knows about and it makes it yeah just more plausible that things could be going on in these little corners of the world it's mm -hmm. not like it's happening in Paris you know yeah, yeah. I think then it would be really unbelievable but yeah, yeah. and makes Paris, it easier really old like long ago so it's Paris but it's medieval times so we don't really know what happened then I wonder what it says about me that I didn't even it never crossed my mind if it was believable or not mm -hmm. like <laughs> that wasn't even a question I was so maybe I was just so like engrossed and I remember I sat down to read 10 pages and I ended up reading 30 or something because I couldn't put it down but well, yeah the, the yeah. question of believability Indiana Jones is does anybody watch Indiana Jones and ask if it's believable <laughs> it does not do you like Indiana Jones Guinevere no, no yes I'm not a fan. <laughs> yeah so there is something really interesting about what I use I used to get into arguments long ago about movies with people and then um it was actually my ex-husband who coined this phrase we started just with everyone saying I liked it and you might not hate it <laughs> just leave it at that so here is what I liked about it you might not hate it I'm not going to put any pressure on you because there is something very personal that we bring to the experience of a work of art and something that we I don't maybe it it taps into what we are seeking guidance on or I don't know exactly um but I can definitely see uh I I can allow for differences of, of response but what I can't allow for is anybody saying that this novel is not good that that would be a tough um statement for me to swallow because I can make plenty of arguments about what is absolutely magnificent about the writing about the descriptions about the heroism about the epic conflicts about but I can see why someone would say well those just don't appeal to me those elements don't appeal to me specifically I didn't think about whether or not it was believable when I was reading it but mm -hmm. when you read that quote I thought yeah you know the whole time I'm reading it I'm thinking yeah 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 come on really <laughs> it just occurred to me yeah you know what it really wasn't believable okay well it sounds like it didn't strike everybody that way um another thing this was from an introduction by Matthew Josephson he said uh the reader may find in it a tale of high adventure on the seas accompanied by a love story on the other hand one may see it as a work of allegory or symbolism embodying some of our oldest myths and race memories filled with the evocations of the subconscious mind and leading into the strangest corridors of the most unimaginable caverns that ever were beneath the sea. Um, that seems to integrate a lot of what everybody just said so far. So placing it in these unimaginable caverns beneath the sea and then tapping into the, um, the, uh, appeal of the of mythology with with these yes grand and uh very dramatic characters but but not meant to be believable in a strict sense oh um sorry I just got reminded of a line on mm -hmm. page 343 in the I don't know what's the copy oh the Hogarth copy mm -hmm. um it said Gilead felt the immemorial need to insult an enemy that goes back to the heroes of Homer. And I assumed that that was talking about when um, it's a talking about Odysseus and the Cyclops. Um, mm. And so that kind of brings it back to the mythology again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was on 343, you said? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. towards the top. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, let's see some topics that I had. 
so part of it, okay, one description I read of this, I think this is from Rob, was that it's a battle with elemental forces. There was a line in our last reading that said, described it as a single human pitted against, or he says a single human pitted against, and this is a phrase from the last reading, the silent inclemency of phenomena going their own way. So a single man against the wildest for, uh, forces of nature, the winds, the sea, the storm, the cre creatures of the deep. Um, we see him one by one take on all these elemental forces. Now, it seems important to this novel that that's what we're seeing. It seems necessary that what we're seeing is one man, the human will, against the most dramatic forces of nature. Um, so, you know, you, you said you didn't consider whether it was plausible or not. It does feel like we're not really supposed to ask ourselves that question. We're just watching a single human will battle the most formidable forces of nature. Um, now, a question that I have about the book overall is, what is the gen? And we can't really answer it till we finish it, of course. But what is the what is the general theme of the novel? What is he after fundamentally? What is he trying to portray? And is this battle of the single individual human will against the forces of nature essential to what is the overarching theme of the novel? So does anybody, I know we can't answer the question in a final way until we finish it, but does anybody have a sense what they feel like is Hugo's overarching purpose in presenting this story to us? Well, I sort of do, but I'm actually not going to say anything because I went ahead and read the rest of the book. Okay. <laughs> so, so okay. I'm going to. I mean, that's definitely a theme throughout is man's relationship to nature. And, and, um, you know, earlier in the book, I think it's more embodied in the superstition that a lot of them feel about the world around them versus, um, uh, you know, the introduction of the steamship and starting to see that transition away from more superstition and then kind of all climaxes with, you know, to me, that what I love so much about this last ring, it, it is, like you said, the most essentialized version. It's it's man's will against nature. Oh, yeah. And that's why I, I didn't even consider believable because that is like such a fundamental struggle at the essence of what it means to be human is like to figure out how to deal with nature and reality in general. Now that can be abstracted as a way to figuring out how to wrangle lines of code or solve engineering problems, but still like this mm -hmm. like desire to grapple with reality and, and um, tame it. And I love, mm -hmm. absolutely love the way he like personifies nature in this chapter too, or in this section. If you um, wanted to portray this, the human will against nature, how better to do it than to have him go through the, that long series of trials? And then in the end, this is on page 370, we have, okay, so first of all, the last of the trials requires that he strip himself naked and use the his clothing to stop the leak in the ship so he is naked he is run out of food he has um there's not a it says there's not a ship at one point he climbs up to the top there's not a ship to be seen on the horizon anywhere he is utterly alone um and that's how we see him at the end so on one side were ranged the vast expanses of the ocean the waves the winds the lightning the meteors on the other one man on one side the sea on the other a human soul on one side the infinite on the other an atom and then a few lines down it says he at a, he gazed into space he had not a single garment left he was naked in face of immensity <laughs> i mean that and that is the culmination of all those battles so it's literally just him now, what's 
interesting is the final trial is that he just has to wait you know so he puts the yeah he puts the cloth over the leak and then he has to wait and see what happens in the morning and I've seen a lot of I've seen several critics mention this as thematically important in the book and is that he he does that he has to wait and then at the end on 370 it says he lay there alone in the night on this rock in the middle of the ocean prostrated by exhaustion like a man struck by lightning as naked as a gladiator in the circus um with a place with in place of a circus the abyss in place of wild beasts the darkness in place of the watching eyes of spectators the glance of the unknown in place of the vestal virgins the stars in place of caesar god he felt his whole being dissolving in the cold in fatigue in impotence in prayer in darkness and his eyes closed so he he ends this scene dissolving into wait into uh, just waiting to see what happens and prayer. Um, and it, it Hugo does keep introducing this theme of how does man grapple with the idea of God or of order in the universe when confronting these elemental forces. Um, so <laughs> one, one uh, description I read is that you could interpret it as the final victory of prayer over that most formidable of despots, the infinite. Now, that sounds a little implausible to me as a description because it's not like prayer features prominently in his story or in his success. But at the same time, I do see Hugo continually introducing that theme of trusting to the unknown or there's a, you know, there are the... There's the perspective of the infinite in the sky looking down on this situation and understanding it or or it being sensible from the perspective of the infinite. Um, so I don't know how much that does thematically play into this book. Well, that is the big question I left with after reading this part is why why does he leave that part up to chance or why did Hugo choose to mm -hmm. to arrange it that way because he's presented Juliet as being able to conquer each and everything that's been thrown at him and this last thing he chooses to you know Juliet has to wait and see and that seemed very counter to um so I, I it puzzled me like mm -hmm. it was a beautiful description after of him waking up and I'll I have some thoughts about that but I'm curious if anyone can explain that like Mm -hmm. or help me untangle that a little bit like what what's the significance of Heather that? well okay so Hugo took him like this is a very strong person right Gilead is obviously very intelligent very strong and he's very focused like he has this he has a lot of knowledge all focused in one area and Hugo took him all the way to the end of his resources and the end of his strength and the end of his life like I think he basically like this much further and he would have been dead at the end right so he's all the way to the end <laughs> of what a human can do mm -hmm. um, and I I don't know I think that part of Hugo's point would be that it's not it's almost not believable that humans can do what we do or that we can face what we face mm. sometimes or that we you know that our lives are possible in some ways um, and yet and yet here we are and so I think that that's Hugo saying, look, whatever that is that takes us from like the end of what's possible or plausible, and yet here we are, we continue to exist, we continue to accomplish all this, like that, the, whatever crosses that gap, that's the unknown, that's what, that's where God is. That's how I, that's what I see Hugo kind of saying is like, all the way to the end of the strongest man you can imagine. And yet mm -hmm. there was that gap he couldn't cross and that must be where you know that's the unknown <laughs> Ooh, i quite like that because it t ties with what lisa was saying about the infinite right um nature is going to go on right like we are mortal and the ocean's not going away we've seen the ocean outlast many many humans um and the whole kind of it, it's an interesting thing about how humans live where we we do struggle and struggle and struggle 
only to inevitably die in the end anyways. Um, and it, interesting. That, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you I do what you can in the internet. Yana, you go ahead and then I have a yeah. thought. Yeah, well, it was interesting that, uh, you know, yeah, he's strong, he's powerful, he, he he won all these battles, but at the beginning, remember, he says, fooled you, he was you know, cursing in the skies, and then at the end, says, okay, I submit mercy, like, you know, so then, then, then finally, he says, okay, well, I can't, okay, now I can't do anything, I have to wait, so therefore, I submit, and he admits that, you know, there's, but he doesn't, it's, he's not defeated, and he still survives, and he goes on, but there's this kind of, his attitude change, and says, okay, Okay, like I'm powerless now. I can't do anything more. Mm -hmm. Shoshana. Yeah. Well, I think that part of what we have here is the question of who actually is his opponent or enemy, because mm -hmm. nature can't think, and mm -hmm. yet we keep having hints that somehow, uh, you know, the storm is against him, mm -hmm. and uh, the devilfish certainly is a representation of evil, and yet is not actually a thinker, and that's part of the problem. You can't argue with it. You you can't reason with it. I, I think that with, with Gilead, just what everyone has said is that he gets to the end of what he can do, but he's on the side of a good force in the universe, and I think one of the reasons that we know he's going to win is that we have this book, and it's still got pages. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, it wouldn't be that somehow he dies on page 372 and the book goes on. Who would be interested in that? How would anybody know all of these things that happened? And I don't think we actually believe that he sat and wrote down a diary or dictated anything, but just his consciousness is where we've been for this whole section. And it goes on, you know, it goes on past 372. And so He's at the end, but the universe is not at the end, and the universe is on his side. And we haven't mentioned Clubin. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I think that's part of what's going on here is that he sees how we see how Clubin, Clubin came to the end of his road. And he planned for such a long time. And he wasn't, he was out to fool people. And he thought that trickery was the way to go. And he thought that he could counterfeit goodness. and he thought that that was what won in this world. And we have not watched him for a while, but now we see how that ended. Mm. You know, and um, fortune, I don't know if you say fortunately or unfortunately, we don't actually, we're not put through the agony of what it must have been like to get killed and eaten by crabs. But I don't think, well, it, it, it looks as if, I don't think, I don't imagine he was praying and it doesn't look as if he probably had a lot of resources against it. So that's how his story ended. He doesn't win. He mm. can't win. Mm -hmm. The universe is not on his side. And mm -hmm. he he doesn't even know where he is. You know, he's in the wrong place. Remember, that's sort of how he he got mixed up about where he was, even after all the planning. So I, I think he's part of our story that we get to the end of his story is we're sort of getting to the end of Gilead's battle, that he does everything and he's on the right side because he's a good person. And there's one more thing we didn't mention that to me is very cool. Um, he he wants to die before the engine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but the engine isn't nature. The engine is something made by a person. And it, it's as if he's got some kind of loyalty to that. So does everyone remember that scene? Because I think I didn't entirely. Okay. I don't think yeah. I, it stood out to me the first time, but it did to me this time that um, when he's positioned such that if the, if the sea takes the engine, it's going to take him too, yeah. but he's totally fine with that because he, if it's going to die, he wants to die first. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Luke. So a question uh, going off of what Shoshana is saying, does Gilead know that he is on the right side? Does he know that um, in this, he's part of this epic confrontation and that in some way, does he know that he, he deserves to win or he, he is a, a force of moral goodness against these things? Or is he just unaware and just in the gladiatorial arena at the mercy 
of things. Hmm. Well, well, I don't know if he necessarily has the kind of pride, but he certainly doesn't think, oh, gee, I should have stayed at home. Hmm. Or, or what is, isn't there another woman out there? Or why did I do this? You know, there, there isn't anything like that, that he thinks of himself as being in the wrong. He's been well, direct. It's over uh, on 333, by the way, the, uh, that, that passage about wanting the, uh, the engines being like a person. I don't think he could have worked that hard for it if he didn't think that he deserved it. Like the work is what makes him good and makes him deserve it. But it's not like somebody else is going to hand it to him as a reward. He's going to go and win it for himself. The only, I think the only question is there's something kind of implicit in your actions, but there's that's different from being self-conscious about it. Um, and so, Luke, the lines that, I don't know if this answers your question or not, but the sort of lines that stand out to me are um, on 339, it says, Gilead pondered, shuddering, but he was unabashed. His was a soul that had no thought of defeat. Mm. That's, that's how I think of him as truly the embodiment of will. He's made a decision to go out there and rescue the engines. That decision is set. Everything else is, um, he did that on behalf of De Rochette. So that was the first prompt, but for De Rochette, he just resolves to go get the engines. And then everything else is a focus on that, um, on seeing that task through. And I don't really see him as reflecting ever or contemplating, or is this right? Am I on the side of the good? Even when he encounters Clouban, there's no thought about what kind of person Clouban is or how he ended, or he just kind of takes the stuff obviously to return i'm sure to return to um late theory um but he doesn't he, there aren't any real thoughts about it another line on 341 it says he too was in a state of paroxysm his vigor had multiplied tenfold he was all intrepidity but there's all these descriptions of like he was intrepidity he was um a soul that didn't think of defeat and those are the dis descriptions of him and little of him thinking about himself or his place more broadly and the question of of right and wrong or the uh or even just thinking about himself at all just thinking about the task so to make a clumsy analogy to atlas shrugged uh and characters there he's Gilead is more hank reardon than john galt hmm. It's more, I'm going to full bore create versus I'm going to understand what, why it's, why it's moral for me to be doing what I'm doing. Well, I think it goes back to what we've discussed with him before. And that just like that childlike element of his soul, that he's not self-aware. He's not, um, he's not a deep thinker. He's, he's intrepidity and will. Um, By the so, way, just remember that part, bit about he's a one man Iliad, mm, you mm. know, but, and 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 that's it's it's in the sentence where he, one man Iliad's in despair, but well, mm -hmm. being <laughs> all of the Iliad in one person, I, I don't well, I don't know another way to put it, but but you know that's who he. Mm -hmm. You can't quite conceptualize it mm -hmm. because how can one person? be a whole story but it's it, it's as if that whole story turns into one person who who can act i don't know it's a it's a hugo type phrase and mm -hmm. uh, it just i mean it fits more with what we were saying before about the myth but a one-man iliad mm -hmm. yeah um so what i'm still struggling with is how these the story of the one man Iliad and the love story and these philosophical questions that Hugo introduces about what it means to battle the elements how or whether they all fit together into a coherent whole so a, a couple of the lines that I was talking about he says when Gilead confronts the the um devilfish it says these creatures almost cause concern about the creator. 
and then um, they are darkness made into animals. What is the point of them? What purpose do they serve? We return to the eternal question. Um, or when the storm comes, it says, and it's that eerie calm before the storm that's misguiding and um, and you know what what lurks behind it. And it says, day breaks radiantly and the dawn smiles. This was what filled the ancient poets and seers with religious horror, appalled as they were that the sun should be thought to be false. Um, so there's all these lines about the, uh, the when we face the unknown, when we face the formidable, when we face the the evils, what what seem like evils in nature, it troubles us about the existence of God or you know of order in the universe. He, he brings back that theme repeatedly, but I'm not sure whether or how it does fit into a, into a whole. Um, well, here is one of the questions I had that relates that. So the last chapter is called, There is an Ear in the Unknown. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. this switch now from throughout this whole part, nature has been his adversary. It's been assaulting him over and over again. And then in this chapter, in the ear and the unknown, you get the sun and the wind caressing him, breathing life back into him. It's this, it essentially resuscitates him. Like it, it starts by saying, we think he might be dead. And then all of a sudden, after like just a few nudges, the sun warming the rocks around him, it brings him back to life. And so that's one of the parts I found kind of interesting and confusing too. And dovetails with that question of, okay, what are we, what, what do you go trying to tell us about? Juliet's been pushed to the edge. He's done everything he can against this adversary. And now the adversary has switched what it's doing. It's now not his assaulter, but his resuscitator. Um, and how does that fit into the unknown? And so those are the questions I have that I cannot answer. So yeah. are we to interpret that scene as meaning that, you know, God has answered and is, is aiding him in the in the end i think what you just said is really right that um, he turns his adversaries into his allies in a way and i think there's been a pattern of that that there's been something wrong and then he turns that i can't keep track of all the things he does this i mean if i can't read it how could a person do it but, but it's, it's it's a technique that he has of oh here's a problem i'll turn that into an advantage I think there's probably a list uh, of you know several things like that and so even here even the waiting which is agony that's an ally too because the sun's going to come and and um he's done what he can i i, I think that and what he and he needed rest at that what yeah. he needed was yeah. rest mm -hmm. this is a little different but i think that Juliet also reminds me of a lot of Old Testament characters and in the Old Testament there's a lot of times when people are being tested by God and it's completely it just makes no sense and God seems angry and cruel instead of merciful and then they oftentimes they have to pass a test I'm thinking of like Abraham or Job and then at the point at which they pass that test then they're given mercy mm -hmm. but it's interesting because I think that Hugo usually depicts a merciful God and here it's almost like a more Old Testament God. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of an unclear thought, but. No, it's not. It's, but that's what, so at first I thought, well, there's not a very pronounced reference to prayer or to God coming into the picture at this moment. But when you mention the chapter title, it seems much more explicit um, than it, than I thought. Oh, and the footnotes, oh. did anyone notice that the footnotes were, so the chapter called De Profundis Ad Altum, it's a reference to Psalm 130, verse one, which is out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. And then the chapter title that Joseph referenced is the second verse of that psalm, which says, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Mm. So you're at the depths and then you cry out and the Lord comes, I guess. 
And I can't find the line. But I think in the previous chapter, so chapter six, it says he cries out. And then I think there's a line like, and somebody listens or so, sometimes somebody listens. So there is this implication that like somebody is answering or some, some force is answering his call for mercy. And I'm trying to figure out how I feel about this. Like, does it undermine his heroics at all? Um, and I'm also, I, I didn't read carefully enough. So here's another question I have, but I, I don't think I read carefully enough the relationship Juliet has to nature, but I don't recall it being spiteful or hateful on either side, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you have battles of equals that, you know, you, you often see this like in a boxing match or something where they have immense respect for one another. Does is your sense of his battle with nature that he goes presenting it as good versus evil or as two wills or forces coming together? I find, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I find it confusing because there's there, you know, he discovers, um, okay. He introduces the devil fish as a hypocrite. And I was like, Oh, hypocrite. <laughs> Seen that word before and then later he makes a direct connection as one is the hypocrite of uh the body and one is the hypocrite of the soul or something like that that he does connect Gluben and and this is I feel no pun intended out of my depth here because, <laughs> because um even just conceiving okay these questions about things in nature that seem like representations of evil are they representations of evil metaphorically are they evil literally i mean are, is this the presence of evil in the world literally or um are they not evil in the grand scheme of things because there's an order and sensibility to it as a whole and you're just a part of it was was that were those categories clear um that's yeah. what like I'm struggling with the book overall is the things that he's when he's confronting the storm the, the sea the octopus is he confronting evil is he confronting what feels like evil but is not um in, if he could have take a god's eye view um or is he confronting uh evil metaphorically embodied in these things i so, think the oh go ahead oh well i was just going to bring up a quote from last time from the last section we read that that is about evil that um that i've been thinking about as i read now because so he says this is on page um, 296 but he says evil is present in everything as a protest against things as they are it is a hurricane that harries a ship at sea it is chaos, which hinders the emergence of a world. Good has unity, evil has ubiquity. Evil upsets the pattern of life, which is a logical system. It causes a fly to be devoured by a bird and a planet by a comet. Evil is an erasure on the page of creation. So I think that's what he's telling us is that like, it, it is metaphorical in that sense. It's like anything that's destructive, especially something inherently destructive, but it's also literal because the existence of chaos is the existence of evil. And there was no chaos in the Garden of Eden. Right. right. <laughs> um, so I, one of this is, I'm going to introduce this line that just, I feel like it's just going to complicate more than it, than it helps, but it's really been, um, it's been on my mind. So one of the lines in Graham Robb was that this book can be taken as a metaphor bear with me on this, a metaphor for the 19th century. Technical progress, creative genius, and hard work overcoming the imminent evil of the material world. I'm confused already. <laughs> that could follow the technical progress, creative genius, hard work, overcoming the imminent evil of the material world. Gilead's mission, like that of any engineer, is to conquer gravity. Okay, yeah, we're with him there. And thus, in Hugo's view, the dumb weight of original sin. Mm. That, I I was fascinated by that, but I'm like struggling to fit that all together. But 
is it that um, these forces were called on to battle these forces? It's the human condition that we have to battle these forces because of original sin. Is that how all this fits together for Hugo? Wait, he's saying we battle it because of original sin or to shake off the notion of original sin? Well, we have, we face the dumb weight. We face this dumb weight of gravity as a consequence of original sin. So, well, if just... original sin is just the condition of having to die, mm -hmm. that is what they're fighting off. Mm. But I don't know if that's what original sin is. That's that's how I think of it, I guess. But is that's a little bit like what Hugo said when he was talking about Letary's, um the the steam engine in the first place about how he was conquering. I don't remember exactly how he put it, but it reminded me of that where he's conquering something with his steamship and then nobody mm. wanted it. <laughs> mm. But I don't remember it specifically. I have, this might not help because it's another kind of enigmatic quote, but I feel like it relates to that on 355. Um, was this after, I'm trying to remember what the context was, but he says that our life is made up of death, such as the terrifying law. We are all sepulchers. Let us live by all means. And then I'm skipping down. Let us live by all means, but let us try to ensure that death is a progress. Let us aspire to worlds that are less dark. And that just, that line really stuck with me, but it was confusing. But I think that it might relate to the original sin. Um, yeah, I underlined that line too. I felt when I got to that, that it didn't feel like a culmination of what had come before. It felt grafted on, mm -hmm. but I'm not saying that means it was, but I think I had the same reaction that mm -hmm. you did that it was kind of inscrutable somehow, but maybe he regards it as re relevant and, and as a culmination in a way that I'm not seeing. Um, um, yeah and but well it, it relates because it's saying that like let us aspire aspire to worlds that are less dark let us try to make progress and move forward but at the same time like our life is made up of death that because original sin brought death i'm mm -hmm. just thinking that you're always weighed down by the fact that you have that and that um there's this cycle of death, mm -hmm. no matter so, how much progress you make. If I'm going to, taking what you said and what Heather said, just thinking of battling each of these elements in nature as a battle with death. I mean, it's a battle for survival, right? So if it's a battle with death, and death is what original sin brought upon us. So that's the, that's the kind of elemental aspect of it, is that it's a, it's a, um, an abstracted, most extreme one-to-one -one battle with death. That's what each of these trials is. Um, and having to face that both, um, well, it's the thing he has to conquer and it calls, when a, when a man is faced with that, it calls into question the the existence of god or the um the large a sense of larger purpose in doing what he's doing mm -hmm. lisa um, i'm trying to um understand more clearly the question that you're asking are you trying to integrate um Gilead versus the nature to get the the engine and um Le Thierry and the Durand and Deruchette and integrate all that together under one thing? Is that what you're trying to do? No, that seems simpler to integrate for me. I'm trying to integrate Gilead and the forces he battles and all of Hugo's philosophic theological musings 
that happen around that story because they're constant. Um, and then, and I'm wondering if that final scene is meant to be an integration of those two in a way that I don't see. I allow the possibility that it's not wholly integrated in that way. I think that's that's a good possibility here, that there's a lot of integration, but it's not that every element of it comes together in a single coherent whole. Um, but I wouldn't want to say that without really struggling to see how it all fits together first. So did that something, answer, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you read something early on that for me, helped me like integrate things and see the, 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 the theological viewpoint. And that was that, that description of the, um, of his being in the gladiatory arena yeah. where hmm. Caesar is God hmm. and he's crying out for mercy hmm. after he's gone through this battle. God's just like looking on like, Oh, that was an interesting fight. And then God is going to decide whether or not, hmm. you know, He's mm. going to accept mercy or not, mm. so that there's this pit where good, where mankind is fighting, and maybe mm. what Heather's talking about, that you know, there's the rack of the reef, and there's a struggle here on earth, and then God is going to determine whether or not He's going to have an ear to you and and listen and say, all right, all right, mm. you can come out the other side alive. So that mm. that's how I'm kind of seeing it. Versus here's Gilead. I am a force for good and I'm a, a knight in shining armor and I'm going to cleave away the evil devil and the enemy. Um, or I'm just a, also, I'm just a plaything of nature. I'm, he's not just a plaything. He, he might feel like that at the end, but he's reaching to the unknown saying, please, can you give me a break here? I did all this. I took all the clothes off my back and put them in that hole. And can I, can I have one, one, one? One that I didn't have to fight for. Mm -hmm. But I don't get the sense by the last chapter that Gilead's defeated or feels defeated mm -hmm. or that, you know, the unknown's taking pity on him. Um, mm -hmm. And I, part of me wondered, like, it, it felt like the right chapter. So I didn't feel like, it, I didn't understand fully how it integrated, but I didn't feel like it was not integrated either. And one of the questions I had was, Nature, as Shoshana mentioned this earlier, nature doesn't actually think, despite all the personification of nature in the chat in, in this section. Um, nature doesn't have a will in a way, and it just is. And so is it necessary to then see the positive side of nature too, right? Nature has been so this force against him and this obstacle for him. But sometimes nature does, like I'm sure we've all experienced, like sitting in the sun and how re-energizing it can be and that also is part of nature and we just haven't seen that we didn't get to see that part during the struggle so is that a necessary element to show in that like and, and how does that relate to Juliet's will but but that's the part that intrigues me is like what is that a necessary aspect of it is yes our struggle as humans is to conquer nature but it's not really against nature it's not like we hate nature. We're, we're trying to master it, but we also need it in a way, in a lot of ways. And is that part of the integration at the end? Yeah, well, Gilead didn't go out there as a show of skill. Like he didn't go out there intending to battle nature to prove his strength or anything like that. He went out with, a, with an aim, right? And then it's just that that's what he had to do to get to it. But yeah. I think it's that, it's that like, the good and evil and the like you know the part of nature that allows for order to exist and life to exist versus the part that's destructive but i'm really reluctant to call it good and evil though because you don't say fooled you to something you think is like a villain and evil like you say that to a worthy adversary that you respect so i don't get like as i'm reading this section i don't ever see like good versus evil i just see two forces colliding and so i think i can reconcile both of those though because for Gilead, it's not a question of the good for Gilead, it's a question of accomplishing the task that he's accomplishing so it is will um but a lot of the descriptions use the word evil in talking about 
these elements of nature. And that I'm starting to understand, thanks to this conversation, is just evil in the sense that um, having to face death is facing the forces of evil. That is, that is what this battle for life or death is. But it's not, it's not that nature is evil. And it's not that um, it's not that Gilead is good and facing that evil uh, in that sense. It's not we're not seeing a, um, a hero versus an enemy. It's that the struggle to survive the battle against death is a battle against the forces of evil. But if there was a line, I I'm I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. And it's funny because it struck me, but it it didn't. I, th I liked the quote, but I didn't see it as as really significant. But after this conversation, I am. So now I want to find it. But it was talking about nature, which can be a nurturing mother figure or can be um, destructive, depending on what element, you know, what element of nature we're talking about. But here we're just abstracting nature as it's going to cause you to die <laughs> if you don't if you don't take it on and um, succeed in battling against it. But that's why Joseph, like I really, that's why this struggle to integrate it with all the philosophical musings, because I was trying to understand in what sense he's finding evil in nature i yeah this is where i wish i read more carefully so i don't know what i can say hugo's actually saying but my sense of it at least is that kluben is evil nature is not right there's some I, i'm very reluctant to ascribe evil to nature because there's something or, or even to just describe evil as the thing the force that causes us to die because there is a difference between nature and how it might we might um succumb to it no, versus you've got to think to understand it in the way i'm suggesting you have to think of it in a biblical terms we mm -hmm. didn't we weren't meant to die according to genesis death was not the plan death came about as a consequence of original sin Oh, I always thought original sin was the knowledge of good and evil, that we didn't, we were ignorant to that knowledge before. And then, you know, everything was just blissful and good. Maybe, maybe those are, maybe that is the same thing in this context. Uh, but, well, Lana, you'd probably be best. To... It, it's both. And it's, it's both of those. The but thing... again, there was a death before original sin. And then that was there was a change after, but it relates to the good and evil because after original sin, there's the possibility of death of the body along with death of the soul, which is a result of evil. So that's how they're connected, I think. But, mm -hmm. but that's why I'm saying we have to think of it in those terms. To understand. I see. Not, right. I'm, I'm projecting philosophically you're, onto this. Yeah. How you're yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is, in this context, it, what evil means is death, like anything that can bring, like, can can um, interfere with a human being's ability to live. So in this case, the storm is evil, uh, because it, it may crush him, right? Just that. Yeah, and there's that. another aspect or element or perspective on the storm that would not be evil. I can imagine... Hugo watching a storm from his balcony in Guernsey and seeing the beauty in it and describing the, the beauty in it. It's simply the fact of the element of it that Gilead has to do battle with for survival. That's a fight with evil. Which which mm. has to do with Gilead's will, right? Like, so good and evil has to do, like, there has to be a will in order to even determine what's good or evil. Mm -hmm. And it's Gilead's in this case, but I guess it could also be God's, like that's where original sin comes from is a violation of God's will. But yeah, Gilead's will is the center of this, really. Well, there was the line at that. Um, uh, oh, it was in the line, that, the inscrutable line that you read, Lana. There was something about 
following conscience, conscience as leading us on that road to progress. And conscience for Hugo is definitely God's voice within us. Um, this is also interesting. <laughs> what are we coming away with? <laughs> are we? I have one, but Yana first. Yeah. yeah. I was just saying, I'm just thinking about Hugo and and religion and his view of of this. Was there anyone at his time writing who didn't come from this kind of Christian or religious perspective? Because I think it's in a lot of these classics that we read. You know, that is always a big element. So I'm just curious that was Hugo well I mean Hugo wasn't typical of his time but you know but you know yeah and I'm always intrigued by how much Hugo is unique in his mm -hmm. religious perspective because he's so um he has there's so much in here that's critical of you know the dominant religious sects of his time and yet there is this ever-present theme of the pre the presence of the divine and the and God and um and yeah, so it, it just sort of fascinates me, but I don't know a lot about how uh, how he held it. I only know it via the references that he makes in, in the novels. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we'd have to say that at some level, he wants to have it both ways, that from mm -hmm. Gilead's point of view, the storm is his enemy, but he himself just thinks, well, this is a, this is a task. This is something I need to do. And then there's this distant point of view of Hugo looking at the whole situation and say, come on now, why would a good God invent a devil fish? Mm -hmm. What kind of sense does that make? Mm -hmm. And and then asking, you know, could things have been better arranged? Isn't it a isn't what they call the problem of evil? Is isn't that a problem and is there a solution and he basically wants to walk away from that and say well at least we need to do what we can ourselves mm -hmm. but i think the reason it's in here may you know is of course ugo is talking about things that are interesting to him but the idea i think is that the situation this battle that we're witnessing is not just an action story it's it's a story for all of us who are not at sea mm -hmm. I think that's why he's doing it because he doesn't want this simply to be a story for people who might experience something literally like this. But uh, what does it mean if there's a threat that you don't understand? Mm. Uh, even that bit about the Piaver, the devilfish being a hypocrite. Well, we've met, as you say, we've met a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. And one of the horrible things about a hypocrite is that it's hard to know what the actual values are. You don't know how to talk to the, hypocrite you don't know if the person in is saying things that are part of the hypocrisy or real it's it's almost as if what, what you were saying joseph about open enemies you can respect you know what side they're on a hypocrite you don't know what side the hypocrite's on mm -hmm. it's hard to it's hard to fight the hypocrite mm -hmm. so possibly i think that Hugo is giving us a character who in some ways is got courage, but also doesn't have the philosophical bent of Hugo himself. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why what you said about something feeling tacked on. Mm -hmm. there, you mm -hmm. know. So he's trying he's presenting uh he's presenting this heroic story of an individual will against the elements of nature. And then also bringing in questions that one might ask about the necessity of fighting these battles um big philosophic questions you might ask about the necessity of fighting these battles to bring his broader worldview into the story too but it's not going to be Gilead's reflections it's reflections facing this sort of trial or observing this trial that we might have about um these yeah broader uh Including the, including the fact that it never seems to end. I mean, I, I think that in real life, some of us might have to do one thing, one day, one week, that would be very difficult. And people can sometimes do it by adrenaline, you know, of pick up a car when there's a child underneath or something, and you wouldn't ordinarily be able to do it. But he's got to do it again and again and again. And then here we go. It's not over. 
So that's an element that I think is um, even Gilead is uh, more, you know, more that he has to do until he gets to the point where there's nothing else to do. And then he's just naked like Kuban, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the description of that. Um, it was a, a naked skeleton. Mm -hmm. Everybody was done with him. Mm -hmm. And then beneath, course, oh, they, beneath the sea, having been devoured, because that's the proper ending for his character. Um, well, I found this helpful. I think I want to still, I want to still, I think it'll be useful to re return to these questions after we finish the book and see if it fits together any better. Yeah. Um, for now, I'm going to do the cop-out thing we sometimes talk about doing which is to imagine the book that we want in our mm. heads mm. or the the integration for me it's an epic battle of wills and the endings like the last chapter is sometimes you do exert your entire will and it's still a victory even if you don't conquer it all on your own mm. right there's still problems you face that feel exhilarating and you know sometimes you get a lucky break but I need to reconcile that a little bit more, but I can, I think I can jump through some hoops to make it reconcile for me. I'm so interested in this issue of seeing Gilead as good or not and satisfied or not, because mm. neither of those seems to apply to him. He neither seems like a good character, like a representation of good, nor does he seem like he um, gets any significant satisfaction from what he's accomplished it's just not what i wanted to ask observed. about that yeah. Yeah. yeah what is what how would you describe his reaction to having oh accomplished all this and it's like now on his way home what's how, but what that's is that's doing? why he really does seem like the embodiment of will we're just watching strength <laughs> just okay but but he does out. he does see at the mm -hmm. end he, he he sings the the bonnie dundee yeah, because he's going back to Derochette. <laughs> yeah, because he succeeded in what he's doing. So what I, I felt almost simultaneous like I was really happy that he was stinging, mm -hmm. but at the same time, is that too subtle? Like I maybe I wanted more from No, but but I think it has I think it's meant to be utterly almost prosaic. He's just humming on his way back to he's humming this song that's back in his head because the mission has been accomplished. But so I think of it as he result he he falls in love with De Rochette in whatever terms or um that means for for Gilead. He gets this opportunity to win her hand by taking on this battle. And then it's just the battle. It's the battle abstracted. It's just force of will against these elements of nature. And There's now yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, like at the beginning of the book, one of the first things we heard about him is when he did that race. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing, like, is the exertion of his will that is the satisfaction for him? Like, why did he do that? He wasn't going to win anything. That's not why he did it. He did it because like, yeah, challenge. I'm going to do this. Almost. And it's I, I don't personally, I don't even think of it as him going, oh, yeah, a challenge. I can't yeah. even imagine him going, oh, yeah. No. <laughs> it's just like, it's a challenge. Yeah. I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I like that uh, Edmund Hillary quote, right? He is the embodiment of that force within human beings. Like, but it's not the, the part, desire part, of, not, not the, the desire, mm -hmm. just the compel the compulsion part. I would say, um, like he is the he is compelled to solve those problems, not like dispassionately almost. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see it as like. But there is a weird sort of satisfaction to it too, and maybe that's just my my perspective looking at him but yeah, yeah he no, but that's he, what i would keep separate is your perspective yeah, yeah. Looking at him but his, like, his actual like if you read about him he seems dispassionately just like this is the thing that needs to be done okay there's no there's no emotion um oh. the part where he's where it says that he didn't feel joy he just felt happiness mm -hmm. i think that has something to do with it too because it's not like this passionate yes i accomplished it it's like this is the state this is like his natural state is mm -hmm. to have this level of exertion and this level of whatever like just imposing his will on the world that's where he's happy it's when he's got something like that that's where he lives 
for this, I think this come maybe partly from your art tours, Luke. What I really want to do is have someone who's very similar and then someone who's similar but different. I want, or I want to find characters who are similar but different. Where um, so Luke mentioned Reardon before. Like Reardon has a lot of similarity in terms of his ability to exert his will, but Reardon also you get glimpses in his in his internal thinking of the joy. Right. You know, when he solves the bridge problem and you get to see that spark and that connection and just his mind just goes from this, um, you know, they, they just pass that law against him and he just starts going like his will goes back to the problem he has to solve. But then you get to see the elation he feels at making that connection, whereas you don't see that with Juliet. Well, I'm glad he got the money. Because I think that that's actually a good thing, in that that wasn't part of the assignment. And if he, <laughs> and, if he, and if he were just, well, this is what I contracted. Oh, money. Yeah. That was that wasn't on the list. But no, the idea is, there it is. He knows what it is, yeah. and it's not as if he somehow was going to get more for it. But just I can fix that. Yeah. And, and that he didn't win. I, you know, I. I I guess I, I, I like that piece of it. He did everything that was possible to do. He stayed that, alive. He got, it's the funny he got the money. Now that you mentioned that scene, that fits in so well with his character too, because what was he, his reaction when he found the money? Nothing. There was no, <laughs> there was no reaction to it. it. Just there's the money. And he's taking, he's taking, there, okay. there was no description of how he felt about that. There was no, this was not the Count of Monte Cristo opening the treasure boxes. <laughs> There was no joy. It's just so matter of fact. Um, that's how I like a matter of fact exertion of will. And I like having a character like that who's just, I'm, I mean, there, someone was telling me about the image of him just, were you talking about the image of him, Joseph with, with the glow behind? I There are so many artistic renderings you could have of Gilead in his successes um but they're just they're not glory they're not um pride they're just will conquering um yeah that's so interesting well i'll give that as an assignment to anybody for next time because i would find it very helpful if i could think of other i mean what are what are other survivalist kind of you mentioned a couple Luke old man in the sea I it's been a year since I've read that but I'm mm -hmm. wondering if that's a great comparison old man in the sea Hemingway I have not read it which I I believe that I ought to have and I understand that it's very short so I should just go read it and then I'll be able to answer that um yeah I don't know if there's any of this element in Moby Dick we don't have Greta here so um Shoshana I'm sure you've read that yeah but no. <laughs> it, it basically he doesn't give up but it's not the same thing it's as... not the same at all okay yeah um tom hanks castaway i haven't seen it but that's it keeps coming to mind um yeah i remember he when he makes fire the first time he's like oh i made fire and he's mm -hmm. just exuberant about his efficacy which is very different from Julia. Mm -hmm. but i for Julia. Uh, he he may be a force of will, but also I I as I've been reading, I've seen a lot of emotion, especially especially when things take turns for the worst. At the end, when he just he's on top of the duvet and just plops down and lies back in despair and just yells out to the void, "Mercy!" Mm -hmm. That's wrenching. Mm -hmm. It's there's there's emotion there, mm -hmm. um, and the so fool do line. Yeah, yeah. Like you don't yeah, say like, fool you if you've got no passion or emotion about the, the whole or all, awareness all of one doing. person, the all the alien one person. But so it it caught me by surprise to have him be really subtle at the end, like la 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 la. Mm. Yeah, I guess if there's any character that kind of reminds me of him, it would be Achilles, with the you know the way that he just goes straight into battle and he's not thinking and it, after Patrick leaves, right? And he's just going at it and. Maybe that's what it 
sort of means by like all of the Iliad in one because he's a little bit like Odysseus with the like the fool Jew and the that the intelligence kind of thing but with Achilles it's just like all action he's got this one goal and it comes from a passionate you know experience because he's avenging his friend but after that after that one catalyst he's all in and it's all action until he until he accomplishes what he want, means to accomplish so I don't well, know that's the closest I can think of I, I feel like Achilles that was driven by passion almost to a fault mm -hmm. like so I think that's how he's different it is the same level of of acting but um it's definitely I mean Achilles almost does things wrong because he's so passionate like he makes mistakes because he's so passionate so yeah Okay, I, I just thought of one. Um, it's a story by Jack London, and it's called The Seed of McCoy. Mm, I don't know it. Yeah, okay, well, you know who McCoy likes the bounty? Mutiny on the bounty? Mm hmm Okay, and there's Pitcairn Island is populated by the former mutineers from the bounty. So let's just say that, yeah, um, it's not a peaceful place. And this um, McCoy, who is descended from that one, is now helping another ship to find a safe berth. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's personal stuff, there's navigation stuff that I don't understand, et cetera. And it's not a spoiler because you know it's going to work. But after he goes through all of these things and wow, you know, we're finally safe and on shore and it took navigation and it took leadership and so on. He says, okay, now I'll be getting back to Pit Karen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he, he kind of doesn't do a victory lap, but everybody else is very relieved but for him he did what he agreed to do and now he's going to go back to life mm -hmm. and that's the closest one i can think of to you know someone mm -hmm. sat satisfied but not um in the sense that he needs to get applause he did it mm -hmm. you know he, he did what he was there to do it's i think it's a good story it's called the the, the seed of mccoy seed means being descended from by jack london and i'm sure it's free you know, Gutenberg. Okay, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, I think maybe that's a, a helpful connection and maybe it will help us to hone in on what is the nature of the emotion. So I agree, Luke, that he's not he's not unemotional, but there's a realm of human emotion that he doesn't seem to experience. The emotion that he feels seems to be specifically caught up in the fight in the battle that's the nature of the emotion and and what but the fight doesn't mean something else for him like pride mm -hmm. or um or a sense of accomplishment or it is it's the the emotions of the battle itself are the ones that i see him experiencing um but I don't know how to classify those or whether there's a way to kind of explain why that would be given the nature of his character, but I think there probably is. I, th I mean, I, this is the, I'll just throw this out as a start because I know we have to wrap up soon, but um, it seems like it's the emotions that come of kind of primal experience, not of reflection and deep thought. So the, the emotions of the battle are going to be almost immediate and primal, but there's no, well, so this, like I, I uh, the, the sense of pride or something, it's just the battle is the absolute because he is the, he's, it's, this is about his strength of will and facing those forces. Um, it's inconsistent because he, earlier in the book you get glimpses of like just this innate sense of goodness he has or perspective on goodness like how he interacts with the kids mm -hmm. killing the seagulls for example it, it doesn't ever strike me as it's a well thought out morality it's just like there are certain things that are just obviously good and bad there was and the line about a, when you have that simplicity of mind you have this internal compass the, yeah. that's just automatic for him Yes, and I think that's consistent with this idea of will. Like, there's this engine, and each problem is just like this automatic. It's not this philosophical thought experiment he's he's 
running every time he's faced with it just this compass that's guiding him guiding every action and next step for him yeah so what's guiding him in it is that instinctive compass it points him in the right direction and then he just has to face what wherever it points him and sometimes where it points him is really <laughs> extraordinarily challenging to face and there's going to be stress and um rage and and emotion and in, in facing that challenge but it's just he he does have just these instincts simple instincts. he doesn't seem dissatisfied to me he doesn't like he seems very contented in a good way and this is probably definitely projection because of the conversations we've been having about dopamine but he's yeah. not chasing the highs yeah. from my perspective at least but that could be that could be some projection mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem like the motivation is I need to pursue the highest of the high three cents. It's just, this is what I need to do. And I'm very satisfied doing it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very interesting. All right. Yeah. So uh, very quickly, we will finish the book for next session. So it'll be at the usual time next Saturday. And then the following week, I'm going to be moving to Sundays um, and I'll send out information about this. But so we have we have the 30th and then the following week, it'll be uh, Sunday the 8th at the same time, 8 a.m. Um, and that's when Sue Lloyd will be joining us for four weeks to discuss uh, the faraway princess or la princesse the Lantin. Um, so I will send out an ebook of it or recommendations of where to find it. Um, and uh, it'll be four weeks of Sundays. And then on Saturday the 7th, we're starting History of Astronomy as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. This was great. Thank you.